Well, good afternoon and welcome everybody. My name is George Drogovsky. I'm a professor of astronomy here at Caltech. Uh, as many of you, but probably not all, know that this is a part of a very special conference we're just finishing now, which is in honor of the 50th anniversary of discovery of quasars, one of the greatest discoveries of astronomy ever, and of Caltech in particular, and Martin Schmidt, who is the man who made the discovery and sitting right here. Um, we're very fortunate today that we have two superb public speakers, uh, Martin Rees and Gunder Hasinger, both of whom gracefully agreed to do these uh, lectures. Uh, and it gives me now a great pleasure to introduce Sir Martin Rees. He is one of the most accomplished theorists in astronomy and cosmology ever. Um, he has an amazingly long list of honors and awards. You know, I was going to mention some of them, but you know, there are too many, but Gruber Prize is one of them. Um, he was, uh, he is astronomer royal. He was uh, head of the Royal Society, among other things. Uh, he won just about every prize in the book, and I will not bore you with that. But most importantly, he's a really nice guy. <laughs> and he's also author of a number of excellent popular books which I highly recommend to you, and which I'm sure he will sign for you if you happen to have them. <laughs> so without further ado, Sir Martin Rees. Thank you, George. Let me say it's a great pleasure to be here. And I should really apologize, because I was asked to give a popular lecture, and I see that the majority of people here are really uh, experts. So please. I crave your indulgence if I say things you know already. Um, and, of course, if I say things which you know are wrong, then please correct me. Um, well, as George said, uh, we are here uh, to celebrate Martin Schmidt. And uh, this is the only picture I could find of him without a bow tie. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, as, as he is today. And uh, uh, it's wonderful to be here to celebrate the discovery of quasars because they were historically important for two reasons. First, they were the first things that showed that galaxies contain more than just stars and gas, and that something extra was later realized to be a huge black hole lurking in their centers. The second reason is that they are so luminous that they can be detected very far away. And they therefore, for the first time, allowed astronomers to see many billions of light years away and therefore many billions of years back into the past. And that was a big boost to cosmology. Well, in this talk, um, I want to set quasars in a broader and partly historical context. They triggered the then new subject of relativistic astrophysics. The gravitational effects of previously known objects galaxies and stars were weak and Newton's gravity theory was good enough to describe them. But that was not the case for quasars. Einstein's theory was essential. Nor indeed was Einstein's theory um, avoidable in the case of pulsars. I'll say a bit more about them later. In the 1960s, Relativity was stimulated by quasars, but also by theoretical developments, in particular by this man, Roger Penrose, who injected lots of new ideas that helped with our understanding of black holes. Um, in this country, the real inspirational guru for relativistic astrophysics was John Wheeler here at Princeton University. And among those who Wheeler mentored was Kip Thorne, whose inspiring leadership has kept the flame burning brightly here, at Caltech for more than 40 years. Uh, Kip was one of Wheeler's better students. He was, he was not his best student because Richard Feynman was another <laughs> student of Wheeler. <clears throat> In the Soviet Union, Zeldovich here had an equally powerful group studying relativity and cosmology. Relativity is also important for understanding the universe as a whole. And another very important development in the 1960s was the first compelling evidence that our universe started off in a hot, dense state, the Big Bang. 
That was a discovery that even in galactic space, it's not completely cold, it's warmed to three degrees above absolute zero by microwaves, which have a spectrum of a black body. These are the cooled, dilute afterglow of the universe's hot, dense beginning. The 1960s were exhilarating for young astrophysicists when there was so much that was new, and I was one of these people, because the old guys don't have a big head start over the youngsters when everything is new. <laughs> and I had a wonderful visit here in 1968 when I just finished my PhD in Cambridge, and I was generously mentored and befriended by Martin Schmidt, Kip Thorne, Peter Goldreich, all still here, and uh, Wal Sargent, sadly, no longer with us. But I'm not here to be nostalgic. Indeed, I want to emphasize that today is an equally great time for young researchers. The pace of advance has crescendoed and not slackened. Instrumentation and computer power have improved hugely. And, of course, we've had huge spin-offs from space technology. Let me say a word about space, because that started in the 60s, really. Well, it started much earlier, and I'm going to show this picture of uh, uh, the greatest British scientist, uh, Isaac Newton, who must have thought a bit about space. This is a picture from his uh, uh, Principia, the English version, and you can see what it shows. It shows a, a cannonball being fired from a mountaintop, and if the cannonball goes fast enough, then it curves downwards in its trajectory, no faster than the Earth curves way underneath it. And this, I think, is still the neatest pedagogical way to explain the concept of orbital flight. But Newton calculated that the speed would have to be uh, 18,000 miles an hour, far beyond the cannonballs of his time, and it wasn't until 1957 that the um, uh, Sputnik got up to that speed. And then, of course, uh, America had its Sputnik moment and uh, went ahead very fast, and only a decade afterwards we had these pictures. And I treasure this picture, signed for me a few years ago by seven of the Apollo astronauts who'd been on the moon. Um, and the Apollo program was a heroic episode, but it was all over 40 years ago. To students, it's ancient history. They know the Americans learnt landed men on the moon, they know the Egyptians built pyramids, but it all seems ancient history motivated by strange goals. <laughs> Had the momentum been maintained, there would be footprints on Mars by now. But instead, uh, we don't have footprints on Mars, we have these uh, unmanned uh, probes that have been to all the distant planets and space technology has given astronomers the Hubble telescope and revealed the far infrared, uh, the UV, the X-rays and the gamma ray sky. And uh, incidentally, it's worth mentioning that much of this was spearheaded by uh, Ed Stone, one of the really great figures in space uh, science, um, who's been pushing the front for 40 years. He hasn't put uh, footprints on Mars but he has, of course, put wheels on Mars. So here are some of them. <laughs> well, humans may one day follow, but many of us are more interested in what life may be out there already before we get there. And I think most experts would agree that prospects are pretty bleak everywhere in our solar system. We might find something. But if we widen our horizons beyond the scale of any probe that we can now send towards the solar, the, the, the stellar realm, rather the solar realm, then things look much more brighter. Because, as many people here know, one of the most exciting developments in astronomy in uh, the last uh, 10 or 15 years has been the realization that most of the stars you see in the sky are orbited by retinues of planets, just like our sun is. And this is one of the hottest current topics and I mention this for any students in the audience. Uh, David Gross, who's hosted many conferences at the Kavli Institute in Santa Barbara, where he's director, he tells me that he rates the liveliness of a topic by its inverse correlation with the average age of the participants. <laughs> and by that criterion, extrasolar planets was the number one topic. So that is encouraging, I think, to young people here. Now, these extrasolar planets are detected not directly yet, but by precise indirect measurements of the parent star. There are two main methods, both very simple ones. The first is to note that uh, if a planet's going around a star, then in fact both the star and the planet are orbiting around the center of mass, the barycenter, the 
the, the planet in a big orbit, the star be much heavier in a small orbit. And it's possible by very careful spectroscopy to detect the motion of the star, even if it's only of order meters per second. And this is a sine wave which indicates a circular orbit of a planet around the star. And from this data, of course, you can infer the mass of the planet and its orbital period, what its year would be. This technique isn't very good for small planets because, say, the Earth going around the sun would in induce a motion of only a few centimetres per second in the sun, and that's too hard to detect by present techniques. But there's another technique that works better, and this is to look for, as it were, the shadow of the planets. A star would dim slightly when a planet was in transit across it. If you looked at the great distance at the Earth moving in front of the sun, the sun would get fit dimmer by one part in 10,000, because the Earth has 1% the sun's radius, 10 to the minus 4 of the area. And the Kepler spacecraft, uh, now uh, sadly dying, did for, for just three years been observing 150,000 stars, measuring their brightness to a precision of one part in 100,000, and doing this repeatedly, once or twice per hour for most of them. And that has found uh, candidates for more than 1,000 planets, many no bigger than the Earth. Well, one would really, of course, like to detect not just the shadow of these planets, but really to see them directly, or to see light from them. And that's hard. To realize how hard, suppose that an alien astronomer with a powerful telescope was viewing the Earth from, say, 30 light years away, the distance of a nearby star. Our planet would then seem, in Carl Sagan's nice phrase, a pale blue dot lying very close in the sky to its star, our sun, which would outshine it by many billions. So you're looking for a firefly and extra searchlight, as it were. But if the aliens had a big enough telescope to see the Earth, they could learn quite a bit about it. Because a shade of blue would be a bit different depending on whether the Pacific Ocean or the landmass of Asia was facing them. So they could learn there were continents and oceans, they could learn something about the climate and the seasons, and perhaps by analyzing the faint light, they could infer there was a biosphere. Well, we can't do this yet, but in future decades we'll be able to. And uh, as a European, let me put in a plug for the uh, telescope which the Europeans hope to build, um, unimaginatively named the extremely large telescope, the ELT, uh, which will have a 39-meter mirror, a mosaic of several hundred smaller pieces, and of course here in the US uh, there are plans for two telescopes nearly as big as this, the NTT and the GMT. And such instruments with, such, with appropriate spectroscopy should be able to draw inferences about planets orbiting other sun-like stars, as well as of course extending the furthest bounds of the observable universe, quasars and all the rest of it. What surprised people about the planets so far discovered is their great variety. There are some Jupiter-like planets very close in, some planets on very eccentric orbits, and some planets counter-rotating compared to their stars, and planets orbiting double stars. Indeed, one was found by two amateur scientists uh, who got a, a, a time series of data from Kepler and looked carefully and found evidence uh, for the uh, transits by, uh, of the planet of the double star. But the existence of planets wasn't surprising because we've learned how stars form by the contraction of clouds of dusty gas. And, the, and, and this is a cartoon which shows how a contracting gas cloud, if it's got a small amount of angular momentum, it'll spin up as it contracts and the protostar will be surrounded by a dusty disk, the bottom right, and that will uh, uh, develop into planets uh, by accumulation of the dust, uh, etc. And uh, so this is a generic process for star formation, so we are not surprised that planetary systems are common. Although, as is clear, they're not all like our solar system. And the key thing is to know how special our solar system is. Here's another flashback to Newton. This is a quote from his Optics. He understood planetary orbits, but he was surprised. He couldn't understand why the planets were all moving in the same plane, what we call the ecliptic, whereas the comets were coming in random directions. 
He thought this was his providence. Now, we've taken a step beyond Newton. We now do understand why the planets are mainly in an orbital plane. I've just explained that just because they come from that disk. So we've traced the cosmogonic causal chain back further than Newton could. And as I want to say later, uh, we've pushed it back quite a bit further still to the formation of galaxies, stars, and atoms, and right back to the first nanosecond after the Big Bang. Although it's still, at some stage, we still have to say things are as they are because they were as they were. They're always unanswered questions. So what about uh, stars and atoms? We see stars forming in places like this, the Eagle Nebula, and we see them dying. This is what the sun will look like in about six billion years. Here's another star dying, here's another star dying in a rather messy way. And this is a famous object, the Crab Nebula, which is the remnant of a massive star which exploded nearly a thousand years ago. And Chinese astronomers, the Chinese counterpart of the Astronomer Royal, recorded this um, and, uh, uh, as a guest star which had be appeared and become brighter than the moon. Uh, we now know, incidentally, uh, that in the, in the center uh, there is an object that keeps putting out energy and makes it shine in bright blue light, and that we now know is a pulsar. There's a star in the center of the Crab Nebula spinning at 30 revs per second with a sort of lighthouse beam that uh, uh, points towards us once every revolution. And that was another great discovery of the 1960s. This was discovered in 1968. Um, we also know now that these supernova explosions, like the one that left the Crab Nebula, are very important. We wouldn't be here were it not for them. And that's because when a massive star is towards the end of its life, it's been gaining energy as a nuclear fusion reactor. It turns hydrogen to helium, then helium into carbon, etc. And it's got an onion skin structure where the hotter inner layers are cooked, as it were, further up the periodic table. And then these are flung back into space when it explodes. And the debris then mixes into the interstellar medium and recondenses to new stars. So were it not for these supernovae, we wouldn't be here. And indeed, each of us contains inside us atoms from several hundred different exploding stars, which exploded all over the Milky Way galaxy five billion or more years ago before our solar system formed. So we are literally the ashes of long dead stars, which were less romantic than nuclear waste that kept stars shining. <laughs> and uh, we are linked to the stars more intimately than the astrologers realize. The people to real to who recognize this were this famous quartet, um, Margaret and Jeffrey Burbage, um, Willie Fowler, who was a professor here, um, and Fred Hoyle, who was one of my gurus in Cambridge. Um, they uh, showed in the 1950s uh, how uh, these processes come about and uh, uh, how we can explain, uh, not just qualitatively, but why gold and uranium are rare, but a carbon and oxygen are common, and how they came to be in our solar system. Uh, this was taken on the occasion of Willie Fowler's 60th birthday, where there was a celebration in Cambridge and a conference, um, and he was presented with uh, uh, a model train, which he was very pleased to have. So the story which they um, have uh, developed, and it's been developed since Burbage and Farrow and Hoyle, is that our galaxy is a kind of ecosystem where pristine hydrogen and helium are being recycled through successive generations of stars. And this process will continue for billions of years more, building up the abundances of the periodic table um, as time goes on. Let's now enlarge our horizons from our own galaxy, our own Milky Way galaxy, which of course is just uh, one of zillions of galaxies we can see. Uh, this is the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, if we could get two million light years away from our galaxy and look back at it, it would look something like this. And here's another galaxy uh, seen face on. And here is a, uh, this is from a survey which shows many thousands of galaxies uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, showing that they are grouped together in clusters, uh, uh, but on a large scale, they're uniformly distributed. Well, how much do we actually understand about galaxies? Physicists who study particles can probe them, crash them together in accelerators, and things like that. But astronomers can't crash real galaxies together. And galaxies change so slowly that we only see, in effect, a snapshot 
of each one. But we can do experiments in the virtual world of our computer. And here's an example of what happens if two galaxies are crashed together. And uh, uh, people here have done much better simulations of this kind. And you get this sort of train wreck, and it'll settle down as an amorphous elliptical galaxy. Because what's happening is that every galaxy uh, consists of stars and gas, and they exert gravity on each other. And uh, I should warn you that uh, the Andromeda galaxy is going to crash into our galaxy in about four billion years, four billion years, and then the, we'll be part of this sort of train wreck. <laughs> well, we, what we can also do is we can look in the sky and see things like this. This is just a, uh, a photograph of two galaxies in the sky, and having done simulations like what I just showed you, we can infer that what hap what's happening here is two galaxies have got dangerously close, one is raising a tidal plume on the other, and if we came back in about 10 to the 8th years, we would find that these two had merged. And the people who do these simulations can, of course, do them for different assumptions. They can put in different uh, ratios of gas and stars. They can also put in dark matter, particles that don't shine but contribute to the gravity, and they can see uh, which uh, uh, model fits best what we actually see. And one thing which is very important as the outcome of calculations like this in other ways is that we do know now that stars, that galaxies consist not just of stars and gas, but they also contain dark matter, a swarm of particles which are not electric charged, they don't emit or absorb light, but collectively they produce about five times more gravity than the uh, stars and gas do. Uh, this is a subject in itself, but let me just mention uh, the reasons why we believe that uh, on the scale of galaxies and clusters of galaxies, dark matter is important. Uh, the first line of evidence is if you look at the cluster of galaxies and see how the galaxies are moving around, you find that their relative velocities are so big that the cluster will be flying apart if it wasn't for some extra force due to some extra mass apart from what you see. And it was Fritz Zwicky, who was another professor here, who in the 1930s was the first person to realize that this was a, a serious issue. A second uh, line of evidence for dark matter is that X-ray astronomers can observe the very hot gas in clusters of galaxies. And from the temperature of that hot gas, you can infer what its sound speed is and uh, how hard it must be to confine it. And this is just... Uh, um, one example, this is uh, the Perseus cluster, and this is a, a map of the X-rays in it. It's rather complicated because it's being churned up by uh, um, a quasar-like object in the center, um, but basically uh, one can infer the temperature of this gas, and it must be confined by a lot of uh, uh, dark material in addition to the galaxies. Uh, there's a third uh, technique uh, which is used to infer the masses of clusters of galaxies. And this is one which Einstein would have liked very much, gravitational lensing. And this is a picture uh, taken by uh, uh, Richard Ellis and others here. Um, uh, what you see on the left-hand side is a cluster of galaxies about a billion light years away. The fainter objects are galaxies several times further away still. And you see these sort of streaks. And they are uh, caused by the a gravitational effect of the cluster which is distorting the more distant galaxies rather like if you had a poorly figured converging lens and you had wallpaper uh, with a regular pattern it would look streaky and distorted and from pictures like this uh, you can infer uh, the mass of the cluster and here again uh, you find that there needs to be about five times as much uh, mass in dark form as there is in the gas and stars we see and evidence has accumulated through these lines of observation and many others that the ordinary atoms, what are called baryons, um, are exceeded, in fact, of, of at least six or seven by the dark matter. And this shows it in terms of, of omega, which is a number cosmologists use. Omega is the ratio of the actual density on average to the so-called critical density. The critical density is the density which you need in the simplest cosmological model if gravity was eventually to bring the expansion to a halt. So we have omega of about 0.3, um, and uh, uh, most of that, more than 80%, is in dark matter.
we can look very far away. And this picture allows us to uh, infer how galaxies are evolving. This picture shows a small patch of sky. It would take 100 patches like this to cover the area of the full moon. But in this patch, which would look blank, looked at through a small telescope, you see hundreds of smudges. These are galaxies, many of them so far away that the light set out about 10 billion years ago or more. And so astronomers can contest their theories of galaxy evolution in a way geologists can't, because they, they can look at things a billion light years away, two billion, three billion, etc., and see if their theory matches not just how things are now, but how they were in the past. And here, quasars have been important, because although we can see some of these galaxies at great distances, uh, because quasars are so much brighter, they can be seen more clearly. And uh, that little dot there uh, is uh, um, a quasar, uh, which uh, is the most distant, which is known. And this is the spectrum of that object. Um, and uh, uh, the important point I want to mention is that the, uh, this is the tracing, and the line, the emission line on the left, is Lyman alpha, the strongest line in the hydrogen spectrum. And that line is normally in the far ultraviolet, 1216 angstroms. But it's stretched by a factor of just over eight. So it's now at the infrared extreme. And so this is uh, uh, looking at a very distant object, uh, a galaxy which is shining brightly because it's got in the center a quasar which is lighting, lighting it up and making the gas in it glow. And so this is uh, allowing us to look back about 90% of the time to the Big Bang. Well, uh, we now uh, think we know that the engine in quasars, which makes them especially bright, is a ma is magnetized gas swirling into a central black hole. Uh, here's a sort of cartoon showing what's, what's happening to the black hole and gas swirling around into it. And the first person to develop this scenario was another of my mentors, Doddle and Nobel. And this was just a few years after the work of Penrose, Hawking, and others, who showed uh, uh, what black holes were like and how they behaved. Black holes, we now know, uh, exist in most galaxies. And Gunter Hasegger in the next talk is going to say uh, more about this. But uh, I just want to make a couple of, uh, of remarks. Uh, one is that black holes are standardized objects. They have a mass, they have a spin, but that's all. So they're almost as standardized as elementary particles. And this impressed Chandrasekhar, who's one of the, uh, the great figures in our subject. Uh, he um, uh, said that the most impressive thing he learned in his life was that there actually are spread through the universe these entities which are described exactly by equations that we can write down, and we have discovered by pure thought. And uh, this is something which impressed him hugely. And we now know, and uh, going to say a bit more about these objects. And the theory of black holes was developed mainly, as I mentioned, after the impetus of Penrose and Wheeler uh, and Hawking and others in the 1960s. But I think it could have been otherwise. It could have been done by this man, Robert Oppenheimer, because in the 1930s, when he was at Berkeley and visiting here a lot, uh, he uh, thought about gravitational collapse. And he wrote this paper, uh, which uh, actually was the first paper to realize the most surprising feature of a black hole, that uh, it's got a sort of horizon around it, which allows things in but not out. So you can't see inside, but uh, if you fall in, you would get right into the so-called single out in the center. Uh, well, um, this is, was a remarkable paper it's probably Oppenheimer's greatest contribution to pure science. But if you look at the date, that's the date that Hitler invaded Poland. And so uh, it turns out that after September uh, 1939, um, uh, Oppenheimer, as we know, is otherwise occupied. And it's uh, uh, rather interesting that nothing was done beyond this paper until the 1960s, under the impetus of Wheeler, Fowler, and the rest. What about looking still further away, further back in time, uh, than uh, even that quasar I showed you? This is a, 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 a not very uh, realistic diagram showing as we look further out, we look back to successively larger shells, and we're going to look back to a time 
uh, before any galaxies or stars form. So if we look far enough away, we expect to see maybe a few galaxies, and then beyond that, nothing, just darkness. And uh, therefore, we want to know uh, something about uh, the early universe. Well, we know that there is this microwave background, which I showed at the beginning, which consists of photons, which have been traveling freely from an era when the universe was about 300,000 years old and at a temperature of 3,000 degrees. And thereafter, the uh, gas cooled down and recombined, and the universe entered the literal dark age until the first stars formed and lit it up again. And we would like to know when and how this happened. From the high redshift quasar I showed you, we can infer that some galaxies had already assembled by then, and that the intergalactic gas actually had been uh, uh, reionized. I didn't go into that in detail, but when you study that spectrum, you can find that the, uh, the gas is, is ionized, whereas after the universe cooled down, it would have got neutral. And we'd like to know what happened to uh, first heat up the universe. We'd like to look further back still than the uh, uh, quasars. Well, one, one thing we can do is we can look at some objects which are even brighter than quasars. Gamma ray bursts. Now, I told you about supernovae. In a supernova, the, uh, the, the, uh, a core collapses to make a neutron star or black hole, and the energy percolates out through the envelope and comes out in a light curve over a few weeks. But in some objects, especially when a star is spinning, the energy that's released in a few seconds finds a quick way out along the rotation axis. And then it comes out and escapes in just a few seconds. And if you happen to be in the beam, then you're going to be zapped by more energy than the sun puts out in its entire 10 billion year lifetime in a few seconds. And so these objects, which are rather rare, the ones that point towards us, are so bright, a thousand times brighter than quasars, that they could be detected even from much greater distances. One's been found with a redshift of nine, but these may be the best probes we have for very great distances. There's another technique, which is again being used here, which is gravitational lensing, because uh, the uh, cluster of galaxies I mentioned is like uh, um, a telescope, and so if you look behind it, you can see galaxies will be too faint to be seen were it not for the lensing magnification. And in this way, some very faint galaxies have been found very far away too. Well, let's now look forward to how we can probe further into this early part of the universe in the next decade. These are some observatories being planned. ALMA is essentially finished. Uh, the ELT and other optical telescopes are being talked about, uh, and JWST is going to go up, and uh, we hope to have another X-ray telescope. Uh, I want to mention, in particular, um, a planned huge radio telescope called the Square Kilometer Array. Uh, and this is uh, um, going to be useful because if we look back into space, um, we look back to earlier times, and we see the gas change from being ionized to being neutral. And if we can do some tomography on this gas, which we can if you have a spectral line, then we can infer in the details how this happens. And uh, this uh, uh, square kilometer array is going to be partly in South Africa on the right, and partly in this uh, uh, large, almost uninhabited island in the southern hemisphere, which is very good for astronomy, uh, there. And this telescope... Uh, we'll have uh, an area of a square kilometer, but spread over there. And what it's going to be able to do is to look for the uh, so-called 21 centimeter line emitted by neutral hydrogen um, and detect this neutral hydrogen um, at all distances, different redshifts. And uh, it only detects gas that's neutral, not ionized. And the kind of thing it will see, I'll just run through these, as you look back to higher redshifts, it will see the gas change from being ionized to being, to being neutral. And that's just one probe that we can look forward to. Well, this is a, a famous time chart showing the uh, history of the universe according to the hot big bang. I'm going to discuss in a few moments the very earliest stages on the left. But first, let me note one important fact. 
it's clear that our present cosmos manifests a huge range of temperatures and densities, from blazingly hot stars to the dark night sky. And when people are told this, they sometimes wonder how this intricate complexity emerged from an amorphous beginning. It might seem to violate the second law of thermodynamics, one of the real uh, touchstones of physics, which describes the inexorable tendency for patterns and structures to decay or wash out. Well, the answer to the seeming paradox lies in the force of gravity. Gravity enhances density contrast. So a region that starts off in the early universe slightly denser than average will lag behind more. Density contrast will grow and it will eventually condense out. And this movie shows a simulation of part of a virtual universe. It models a domain big enough to make a lot of galaxies and the expansion scaled out so the picture stays the same size. But you can see incipient structure unfolding and evolving. And uh, the blue is the dark matter, and the red is the ordinary atoms. And it's the atoms which are eventually going to condense into the stars, um, which we will actually see. Moves of this kind portray how galaxies emerge, about 16 powers of 10 faster than it actually happens. And each galaxy that forms is an arena within which stars, planets, and perhaps life can emerge. And once the galaxy is formed, then gravity enhances the density contrast still further, and gas is pulled in to make stars. One important point. The initial fluctuations fed into this simulation aren't arbitrary. They're derived from observations. They're derived from the observed fluctuations in the temperature of the microwave background. This is data from the European Planck satellite, which has looked over the whole sky at this microwave background, and it finds that some places are hotter by one part in 100,000, some cooler by one part in 100,000. And it can study in detail how rough the universe is on different scales. And the remarkable success of the theory is that if you put in as initial conditions the fluctuations uh, which are observed here, which apply when the universe was about half a million years old, and run your computer forward, you end up with structures on the scale that we observe. Uh, this is a, uh, a diagram due to Max Tegmark. I won't go into details, but the, uh, the solid curve is a theoretical prediction for the density contrast on different scales uh, if you feed in those fluctuations. Um, and we have data from clusters and galaxies and other methods which fits in fairly well. So this is a great triumph of the theory that we can link together the early universe when fluctuations are linear with the present universe under the action of gravity. So we've started to understand how the slight ripples, these over-densities and under-densities present at half a million years, condensed into the first stars and galaxies, ending the cosmic dark age, and ending up with the structures we now see. But what about still further back? In one important respect, things are simpler early on, because there were no structures. Everything was linear and uniform. And we are vindicated, certainly, and extrapolated back to one second, because we can then calculate the proportions of helium and deuterium made by nuclear reactions then, and they match beautifully with what we observe. Indeed, we could probably be confident back to a nanos nanosecond. That's the time when the particles had the kind of energies that can be produced in the LHC in Geneva. And that's a time when the entire visible universe would have been squeezed down to the size of our solar system. But questions like, where did the fluctuations come from? And why did the early universe contain the actual mix we observe of protons, photons, and dark matter? Take us back to even earlier instance, when our universe was hugely more compressed still, when the energies were 10 to the 16 GeV, where experiments offer as yet no direct guide to the relevant physics. So a hazard sign here. Be careful. The physics is itself uncertain. This was a rather nice magazine cover which showed the a very early universe, <laughs> real size. This is when the entire universe was squeezed, not merely to the size of, a, uh, of the solar system, but down to the size of a tennis ball. And according to a popular theory, the entire volume 
we can now see with our telescopes, inflated at an energy of about 10 to 16 GeV from a hyperdense blob no bigger than that. This theory called inflation helps us to explain why our universe is expanding at the right rate, why it didn't recollapse before structures could form, why it's not expanding too fast. And amazingly, it also suggests that the fluctuations, the fluctuations spread across the sky, which you see in the Planck data, and which are the seeds for galaxies and clusters, those vast fluctuations are actually produced by quantum effects when the entire universe was of almost microscopic size. This theory offers clues to another fundamental question. How extensive is the physical reality that scientists can talk about with a straight face, as it were? Well, one important point is that there is certainly a lot of the universe beyond what we can see, beyond what we can in principle see. We can only see a finite volume, a finite number of galaxies. That's essentially because there's a horizon a shell around us delineating the distance light can have travelled since the Big Bang. But that shell has no more physical reality than the horizon in the ocean if you're on a ship. If you're on a ship, you don't expect that the, that the ocean finishes just beyond your horizon. It may go on. You don't know how far. And similarly, the universe could go on far beyond our horizon. Indeed, there are strong reasons for thinking it goes on several thousand times further. The reason for that is that if you look as far as you can in that direction and in that direction, conditions don't differ by more than one part in 100,000. So that means if we're in some finite structure, the gradient across is very gentle, so it's probably much bigger than the part we can see. And it could go on much, much further still. We don't know, maybe so far uh, that uh, um, there are... Um, uh, all combinatorial options fulfilled and we will have some avatar far beyond uh, the horizon uh, that uh, makes the right decisions when we make the wrong ones, etc. So that's uh, uh, perhaps a comfort to us. But that's only the case if the uh, universe goes on for about 10 to the power of 150 uh, times further. But there's something else. The 10 to 16 GeV physics of the inflation era is still conjectural. But some of the options lead to the so-called eternal inflation scenario in which the aftermath of our Big Bang, which already I've said is bigger than what we can see, could be just one island of space-time in an infinite archipelago, as it were, of many Big Bangs. So bottom right, you see a part of the universe we can see, part beyond the horizon, but that may be just uh, uh, one island, as it were, uh, in, a, in a, uh, a cosmos that contains uh, many Big Bangs. This is the idea of the multiverse. Incidentally, when the multiverse is mentioned, people always say, well, these domains aren't observable, so they aren't part of science. But I think that's the wrong way to look at it. I'll give an example. We believe what Einstein says about what happens inside black holes, because we've tested Einstein's theory in many other places. And so even though we can't observe inside black holes, we believe what he says, because the theory has gained credibility. Likewise, if we had a theory which described physics at 10 to 16 GeV, a grand unified theory, and if that was vindicated by things we could observe, like predicting the mass of elementary particles, then we would take seriously its predictions even if we couldn't directly observe them. And one prediction might be the multiverse, because the physics of the Big Bang, uh, uh, if, if it has certain forms, does, according to Andre Linde, predict multiple Big Bangs. And incidentally, I'd like to mention that uh, even the most conservative astronomer here believes in galaxies beyond the horizon which will never in principle be observable. So the idea of things in principle unobservable being part of reality is not one which uh, uh, should uh, raise the hackles too much. So I think a challenge for 21st century physics is to see which branch of this decision tree is the correct one. First, are there many Big Bangs, or is it just one? Second, if there are many, then there's another important question. Are they all governed by the same physics or not? Ed Witten, the guru of string theory, doesn't think so. He thinks there could be a, a huge number of different vacuum states with different physics. So if Witten's right, 
what we call the laws of, fi- of nature may in this grander perspective be, as it were, local bylaws governing our cosmic patch. That patch being, of course, much bigger than the horizon we can see. And many patches could be stillborn or sterile, because the laws prevailing in them might not allow any kind of complexity. But we wouldn't expect to find ourselves in a typical universe. Moreover, we'd be in a typical member of the subset where a universe could evolve. This is what's sometimes called anthropic reasoning. It makes some people foam at the mouth, but I think we just have to be open-minded about whether uh, we need it or not. And we can highlight several essential requirements for the emergence of our complex and structured cosmos from simple amorphous beginnings, which may in some sense feel surprising. The first is that we need gravity to hold stars together to make structures form. But the weaker gravity is, the better. This is my favorite pedagogical picture, which shows on log scale, radius along the bottom, mass along the top. You see a proton, and you see the line of black holes, slope one, and you see um, uh, 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 ordinary objects, um, people, asteroids, etc., planets and stars, and black holes. And you see that uh, um, a black hole, the radius of a proton, contains 10 to 38 protons, and a star is about 10 to 57. Now, the reason this scale is so expanded is because gravity is so weak, because it takes 10 to 38 protons for their gravity to balance the uh, electrical force of just one. And if gravity wasn't weak, then this picture would look more or less the same, but there'd be a, a contraction. There wouldn't be so many powers of 10. You'd still have stars as gravitationally bound fusion reactors, but they would be small. They wouldn't last so long. And creatures as big as us would be crushed by gravity. So it's essential uh, for our existence that gravity is weak. Gravity is not fine-tuned, but it must be very weak. And another uh, uh, requirement, obviously, is some departure from thermodynamic equilibrium. Um, the early universe was in equilibrium and you can not develop complexity. There must be, in the early universe, matter-antimatter asymmetry. Otherwise, as the universe cooled down, matter and antimatter would all annihilate, and we'd have just radiation and maybe dark matter, uh, but no atoms, and we wouldn't be there. Also, non-trivial chemistry. If, if there was only hydrogen, then certainly nothing complex could exist. And this requires a sort of tuning between the nuclear force that holds nuclei together and the electric force which disrupts them. And uh, this, this familiar picture of the binding energy uh, exists because of this, uh, uh, um, this uh, tuning between those two forces, which isn't fully understood. And we need to have stars formed uh, in order to uh, process simple atoms into... Uh, uh, in, into the kind of stars that can have planets around them. The expansion rate must be tuned so that the universe neither expands so fast the galaxies can't form, nor does it collapse too soon before they have a chance to form. And we need these fluctuations uh, in, the, uh, in the early universe. Um, uh, if there were no fluctuations, uh, then the um, universe would, even now, after 10 billion years, be just cold uh, neutral hydrogen. Well, uh, one can have fun with this by asking what would the universe be like uh, if, uh, if things were different. Uh, if you take anthropic reasoning seriously, you have to do this. But uh, I think even if you don't take it seriously, it's rather fun to do this because just like historians sometimes like to explore counterfactual history. Uh, English historians asked what would happen if uh, the Brits had behaved more sensibly in 1776, for instance. <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, biologists uh, ask what would have happened if the dinosaurs hadn't been wiped out, what would have happened then. And in that spirit, we can ask what it would be like if the universe uh, was different. Um, and uh, uh, one thing one can, one can do, uh, but I'll cut this out for shortage of time, uh, is to ask what would the universe be like if the fluctuations, uh, which have an amplitude of about 10 to minus 5, uh, were bigger or smaller. If they were too big, we'd have a chaotic universe with lots of black holes, uh, universe where the fluctuations were ten times bigger would be a rather good universe because we'd have huge galaxies uh, as big as a cluster of galaxies. And if the fluctuations were too small, though, we'd have anemic galaxies because uh, everything would be smooth and uh, uh, you wouldn't have big galaxies and gravity would be too strong. 
So uh, we can ask what are the constraints on, uh, on Q, this fundamental number, and on other numbers. Well, I won't have any more time for that, um, but early in this talk I uh, mentioned newly discovered planets orbiting other stars, so I'd now like to give a flashback to planetary science 400 years ago, even before Newton. This is from Kepler, and of course Kepler thought that the Earth was unique, that its orbit was a circle, related to the other planets by beautiful mathematical ratios. We now realize that there are zillions of stars, each with planetary systems. Earth's orbit is special only insofar as it's in the range of radii and eccentricities compatible with life. So maybe we're due for an analogous conceptual shift on a far grander scale, in the sense that our Big Bang may not be unique any more than planetary systems are. Its parameters may be environmental accidents, just like the details of the Earth's orbit. And the hope for neat explanations in cosmology for having exact formulae for what we call the concept of nature may be as vain as Kepler's numerological quest, where we just don't know about that. Just as an anecdote, I was at a conference a few years ago in Stanford where there was a panel discussion where the panelists were asked how strongly they bet on the multiverse possibility. I said, well, on the scale, would you bet your goldfish, your dog, or your life? I was about at the dog level. <laughs> Andre Linde said he was far more confident. He spent 25 years of his life working on the idea. And Stephen Weinberg then said he'd happily bet Martin Rees's dog and Andre Linde's life. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, let me draw back from these uh, speculations and offer a word about the far future of the uh, uh, volume we are now in, of our, the aftermath of our Big Bang. We had a big surprise about 15 years ago. It was by then well known that the gravity of dark matter dominated that of ordinary stuff. But as I said earlier, it was only about 30% of what was needed to bring the cosmic expansion to a halt. So it would then have been thought that we were in a universe whose expansion was slowing down, albeit only a bit. But rather than slowly, slowly decelerating, the expansion was found to be speeding up. And I know some of the people involved in this are, are here in this room. It was found that uh, uh, the expansion rate of the universe um, uh, was, uh, was not slowing down but speeding up, implying that gravity on the cosmic scale was being overwhelmed by a mysterious new force latent in empty space which pushed galaxies apart from each other. And this uh, famous Hubble diagram was published in uh, 1998. But I wanted to mention that there is some independent evidence supporting this idea, which I, I find also compelling. According to Einstein's theory, a straightforward low-density universe would have negative curvature. So the three angles of a triangle would add up to less than 180 degrees. And that would mean if you had a dis distant rigid rod, its apparent angular size would be less than it would be if we were in a flat universe. And fortunately, we understand enough about the early universe to know that there is in it a particular rigid rod, there's a particular scale where the universe at recombination, that we see here, should be specially rough. And this is uh, what's, what's seen. It is indeed uh, special. This, this shows the fluctuation amplitude for different uh, harmonics, as it were. And that big peak uh, is a, a measurement which shows that to the Planck data, it's very clear that this uh, rigid rod uh, shows up very easily. And what is very important is it shows up on an angular scale which indicates a flat universe. If the universe contained nothing but the dark matter and baryons, omega's 0.3 and open, then that peak would be about a factor two to the left. And I think it's important that that was first discovered um, in 1998, thereabouts, by uh, Andrew Langer and his group here. They got this data from a balloon flight, not nearly as good as Planck, but good enough to show that this peak was where it would be for a flat universe and not where it would be in an open universe. 
And my personal view is that uh, if we'd had that data and not the supernovae, we would also have believed in an accelerated universe. And so we now have this network of arguments. Uh, we have um, the uh, uh, supernovae implying acceleration, but we also know there's a flat universe. We know only 30% of the stuff in the universe is in the form of matter or dark matter. So we know that for 70% must be in some unclustered form. And moreover, that unclustered form must have a negative pressure because it dominates now, it didn't dominate in the past. So you could predict an acceleration, even if you didn't have the supernovae. And I personally would only be partly convinced by just the supernovae, but I'm completely convinced by this network tying together the uh, uh, Hubble uh, diagram with the data that first came, came from Boomerang. And I think this is the surprise, and as to what this dark energy is, uh, we just don't know. But of course, this is relevant to the long range forecast for the universe. Long range forecasts aren't very reliable, but the biggest uncertainty, I think, in the cosmic long range forecast is the nature of this mysterious force. If it gets weaker or changes sign, then there could be a big crunch. If it gets ever stronger, then we have what's called a big rip. Stars and galaxies will be torn apart as it gets even stronger. But the best and most conservative bet is that this force is unchanging. Einstein's lambda in a more modern guise. And if that's so, we would predict an ever colder and ever emptier cosmos. So galaxies would accelerate away and disappear over an event horizon rather like the inside of a black hole. And all that will be left will be the remnants of our galaxy, Andromeda, and smaller neighbors. Protons may decay. Dark matter particles may annihilate. There'll be occasional flashes when black holes evaporate or swallow stars. And then silence. To quote Woody Allen, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. And that's perhaps a good note to finish this overlong lecture, except to reiterate that progress has been owed 95% to advancing instruments and technology, less than 5% to armchair theory. And a great deal of each of those has germinated here at Caltech in the last 50 years, and let's hope the next 50 will be just as fruitful. Thank you. Professor Rees has kindly agreed to answer some questions, if there are any. Don. You refer to the universe being so small in the beginning. Is the possible the universe is infinite? Wouldn't that mean it's always been infinite? Yes. Hmm. Yep. But uh, I talked about the, the part that is, uh, is now within our present horizon, okay, which is the size of a solar system when the energies are 60 GeV and is, is the size of a tennis ball at the inflation era. Well, back there? Yes. Uh, ah, okay, yes. Um, well, th th that's raised the question of whether there is an infinite past or not. And that's a, a big matter of debate, whether, there were, whether you can trace back and whether, even if there are many Big Bangs, uh, there's only a finite past, as there clearly is for our Big Bang. That's a, that's a matter for debate. Um, so so we, we, don't, we don't know. But of course, these other domains are uh, far beyond anything that we can directly observe. But uh, I did try to emphasize that uh, they are um, part of science. Because um, just to repeat, um, uh, we, we know that there are some galaxies um, which uh, are beyond our horizon. Uh, which we can't see. Now, if we were in a decelerating universe, then our, our far future descendants would see those galaxies. So you could say, well, they'd be observable by our descendants. But in an accelerating universe, galaxies now beyond the horizon are beyond the horizon forever. And so my point is that even the most conservative astronomers 
are really implicitly accepting that there's part of physical reality which is never in principle ever observable. And so it's only a step beyond that uh, to uh, uh, take seriously the idea of the aftermath of other big bangs. This is an exercise in, in aversion therapy, as it were. You know, uh, uh, if you don't like spiders, you start off with a little spider a long way away and then end up with tarantulas crawling all over you. And so it's rather like that. But uh, I do want to emphasize the point that uh, 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 it's, 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 a, it's a matter uh, of science whether there are many big bangs or not. We just don't know yet. Well, on that happy note, let's thank <laughs> Professor Ace again. <laughs>